Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal one week early and ad-free on Amazon Music or via the Wondery Plus subscription on the Wondery app or Apple Podcasts. Today's episode contains strong language and language that you may find offensive, but has been included for historical accuracy. Please be advised. Welcome, Matt. Please take a seat. Oh, hi, Alice. I like what you've done with all the candles and the crystal ball. Yeah, I'm glad. Okay, if you just get comfortable and then place your hand in mine, palm up. Are you going to read my fortune? Let's see what the future holds for you. God, this is exciting. I didn't know you could do this. Okay, so the heart line, that's that line from here to here. Okay, yeah. There's a great love in your life, I believe. Yes. I see a long and happy marriage for you. <sighs> that's brilliant. This is so good. Um, um, What do these bits mean? Um, I think that's eczema. It could be psoriasis. Ah, yes, no, that's yeah. eczema. I see moisturiser in your future. And what about that line there? Okay, this line is the fate line. And I see success upon success. This podcast will go from strength to strength. This is amazing. And that is your lifeline. And what does that mean? I've never seen a stronger one. I think you'll live to be a very old, crinkly man. Well, this is incredible. You've made me feel so good about my life and my future. Thank you. Cash or credit? 29th of April, 1895, Soho, London. 17-year-old Alfred Taylor glances over his shoulder. A street lamp casts an incandescent glow across the wet road. Alfred tightens his jacket against the wind. He's sure he's being followed. He ducks under an awning and crosses Soho Square. He can lose his pursuer in the Oxford Street crowds. But then he spots a drunken man tumble out of an inn across the street. Decides instead to enter. Find a back table and wait it out. A drink will calm his nerves. A rush of warm air hits him as he enters. He rounds the narrow bar and finds a spot near the fire. He sits with his back against the wall. Alfred is about to go to the bar when a man walks over to his table, pulls up a chair. He's well-dressed, smart, but he also has a nervous energy. Is it the same man that was following him? Alfred readies himself to run when the man leans in. Can I buy you a drink? Alfred relaxes slightly. The man's merely picking him up. Yeah, but not in a very pleasant way. Why did he chase him first? Well, we don't know it's that man. Good point. Okay. <laughs> He's just buying him a drink, which I would say is a standard way to pick somebody up. <laughs> Alfred leans forward, picking up the stranger's cigarette case. He lets his fingers brush the man's hand. The man smiles. Then suggests they find somewhere more discreet. A few minutes later, they're in one of the inn's upstairs rooms. The man shuts the door behind them. Alfred steps forward, raises his hand to loosen the man's tie. But as he does, he sees him flinch. Then a look of disgust flashes across his face. He's miscalculated. The man grabs his forearm, pushes him roughly into the wall. Don't debase yourself, you lot disgust me. Alfred hears the tremble in his voice as he asks, What do you want? But the man ignores him. Who do you work for? Alfred doesn't work for anyone. He's scared. No one. Myself. I... I... He searches his mind for a name he can give the man. A name that won't put himself at risk. But he's taking too long. He's about to speak when he feels the full force of the man's hand on his cheek. His vision blurs as he collapses onto the floor. He whimpers. Please, please just tell me what it is you want. He feels the man's eyes on him. Then he hears, tell me everything you know about a man called Oscar Wilde. From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. And this is British Scandal. So, Matt, would you say that you have a good relationship with your in-laws? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, They like it when England lose, but apart from that, it's cool. (laughs) They don't, I don't know, uh, shout at you whenever you're in public with your partner, make your life a living hell, throw rotting vegetables at you on your opening night. No. 
I mean, other people do, but not my in-laws. <laughs> well, count yourself lucky, because last episode we left Oscar dealing with Bosie's father, Lord Queensbury, who seems like, uh, what can I say, a piece of work. Yes, that's putting it mildly. I mean, this guy has made it his mission to tell the world about Oscar Wilde's sexuality, and that would have real tangible consequences for Oscar's career in life. Yes, Queensbury's proving a very dangerous enemy to make. This is the first point where we've seen Oscar gamble for everything that he's built up, be it family, career, freedom. Up until Bosie, he's been pretty discreet, and that was obviously out of necessity because being gay was illegal. But as we saw in the last episode... Oscar just throws all caution to the wind with Bosie. There's something about Bosie that brings out a recklessness in Oscar that you can't help feel is going to come back and bite him. Matt, it's almost like these stories follow such a fail-safe narrative structure that you can predict what's next. This is episode two, The Peer and the Poet. Many involved in crypto saw Sam Bankman-Fried as a breath of fresh air from the usual Wall Street buffs. But in just one month, his crypto exchange would collapse. From Bloomberg and Wondery comes Spellcaster, a new six-part docuseries about the wild rise and fall of FTX and its founder, Sam Bankman-Fried. Listen to Spellcaster on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. 16th of February, 1895. Tite Street, Chelsea, London. Oscar Wilde steps down from his horse-drawn carriage. He straightens his dark blue velvet-trimmed overcoat, nervously adjusts the white flower in his buttonhole. Oscar is at the height of his powers. He has three sold-out plays in the West End, but since his latest premiere, he's neglected his children. He spends almost all of his time working, or with Bosie. Today, he intends to make amends. He gathers up the gifts on the carriage seat. It's amazing these cliches just exist throughout history, isn't it? I'll just buy him a present, take him bowling. Exactly. Was there Burger King in 1895? <laughs> yeah, what would be the equivalent in 1895 of going to, like, the multiplex and then bowling after? An afternoon of hoop and stick and pheasant shooting? Walk around the serpentine and then just eat gruel. But as he enters the house, it's not the laughter of his children that greets him. Instead, it's the hushed voice of his butler. Sir? Uh, Lord Queensbury is waiting for you in the library. Lovely butler voice. <laughs> That's clearly where I'm supposed God. to be the whole time. I think a lifetime of service <laughs> awaits you. If only I had the manners to match. Oscar feels his body stiffen. He last saw Bosie's father when he turned up at St James's, throwing rotten vegetables at the staff. The man is a goddamn lunatic. Oscar enters the darkened library, sees Queensbury's silhouette against the window. His shadow splinters across the floor. Lord Queen's... Before he can finish, the Marquess turns, slams his cane on the floor, barks. Where is my son? Oscar has no intention of backing down. I believe your son is sampling the delights North Africa has to offer. Bosie is in Algeria. Right now, it's likely he's entwined with some beautiful boy in Algiers. But Queensbury refuses to be baited. Instead, he delivers his own blow. You get my son kicked out of the Savoy for your disgusting conduct? You sully his name with your... your perverted practices? Oscar is fed up with Queensbury's threats. If you do seriously accuse me of sodomy, Queensbury, I suggest you come out and say it. Oscar? Oscar turns to see Constance standing in the doorway, their two children clutching her sides. Wide-eyed horror etched on their faces. This is his home, goddammit. He refuses to let his family see him disgraced in this way, to see this part of his life. I don't know what the Queensbury rules are, but the Oscar Wilde rule is to shoot at sight. Wilde orders his staff to escort Queensbury from his premises, but not before Queensbury can say, If I catch you and my son together in public, I will thrash you. But only above the waist. <laughs> Oscar tells Constance and the children to go upstairs. He'll be up shortly. He stares blankly at his collection of leather-bound books. His eyes catch John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. Great book. Page Turner. Oh, man, it's so good. It's up there with, um, what's the Jean-Jacques Rousseau one? Definitely thought you were going to say Archer, so that's a relief. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> man, imagine. It's really up there with Brian Clough's autobiography <laughs> and Not a Penny More, Not a Penny Less by Geoffrey Archer. <laughs> 
The Social Contract, I meant. These are the sort of books you read when you first get into politics, if you're sad, like I was as a teenager. When people had on their childhood bedroom walls, you know, posters and things, did you just have sort of cabinet group shots? I I vaguely remember a signed photo of David Blunkett. (laughs) (laughs) Mo Molum. Blair and Brown. I did write to politicians and ask them for signed photos. Yes. So a few of them got... That tracks. Yeah. Mm. Is that sad? He picks up his cloak (laughs) and hails a carriage. Shall we? Yeah, sorry. (laughs) 20 minutes later, he's at his lawyer's office. I want to prosecute that wretch of a man for threats and insulting conduct. Oscar feels empowered, decisive, only to be told by his lawyer that he doesn't have a case. Verbal threats won't amount to prosecution. But his lawyer adds, A man such as Queensbury will likely act on one of his threats at some point. Wilde tells himself that when he does, he will silence this man. Once and for all. 18th of February, 1895. Repton Boxing Club, London. This is still the most famous boxing club in Britain. This is like a hallowed ground for British boxing. Have you been? No, but I'd love to. Why, do you want to fight? (laughs) Meet you there in half an hour. Queensbury watches ringside as two bare-chested boys dance across the floor. The crowd roar as one of the boxers is caught with a series of sharp jabs. He imagines himself in the ring, face to face with Wilde. Pictures his fist crunching into Wilde's doughy face. An hour ago, Queensbury had slammed down a news article lauding Wilde's unprecedented three-play run. The piece quoted extensively from Wilde's plays, and one line had caught his eye. I can resist everything except temptation. He'd felt bile rise in his throat. Wilde's brazen lust for Bosey is despicable. He can't let men like Wilde debase the young. He's an immoral invert, A pervert. It's far better to watch boys strip to the waist, punch the life out of each other. Queensbury has already lost one son. There is no damn way he's losing a second. A roar brings him back to the fight. One of the boxers has slipped. He's caught with a hard left-hand hook. Queensbury watches as he staggers backwards, blood curdling on his brow. The smell of salt and iron in the air. Then he's caught a second time. Queensbury delights as his head hits the floor with a hard thud. He rises to collect his winnings. As he stands, he overhears the trainer of the winning boxer. You stuck to the game plan, didn't get lulled into his strengths. Queensbury edges nearer. Conserved your energy, took him out his place of comfort. Queensbury realises he needs to do the same with Wilde. Have a game plan. He's been taking erratic swings. His threats to Wilde, his threats to Bosey, none have landed. He needs to bait him, draw him out into the open, turn him and all his kind into a public spectacle, then attack. And he thinks he knows how. Later that evening, he heads to the Albemarle Club. It's one of Wilde's haunts. He enters the lobby, takes a card from his pocket and scrawls, For Oscar Wilde, posing as a sodomite. He hands it to the porter. I want you to give this to Mr Wilde, personally. He makes sure the porter sees what's written, relishes the shocked expression on his face. No more rumours, no more hearsay, but a concrete accusation in black and white. And Queensbury knows that Wilde will have no choice but to act on it. A few days later, Tite Street, Chelsea, London. Constance takes a final look in the mirror. She's on her way to a lecture by William Morris. But as Constance leaves her room, she thinks she hears shouting in the hallway. She leans out over the railing, peers down the stairs. Oscar? She watches in disbelief as Oscar bounds up the stairs. He takes her arm, leads her into the bedroom, shuts the door. Oscar, what's wrong? She sits on the edge of the bed, watches him pace around the room. I, I need your help. He starts to speak again, but then checks himself. She's never seen him like this before. He takes a breath. Queensbury, he's, he's publicly accused me of being a sodomite. 
and I'm going to sue Queensbury for slander. Defend my honour. In court. OK, this is a big move because he's effectively saying he's prepared to lie under oath. Constance feels her stomach lurch. She glances at his black velvet jacket, his salmon-coloured scarf. She's about to speak when Oscar jumps in. It's all utter nonsense, of course. Queensbury can't stand the friendship I have with Bosey. Constance hears herself mutter. That makes two of us. Oscar takes her hand, positions himself next to her on the bed. Constance, I can't see any other option to save my our reputation. I'm being hunted like one of his hideous foxes. I need you by my side. Constance feels the weight of what he's asking. The corners of the room start to dissolve in front of her. Then her eyes fix on a small wooden rocking horse in the corner, a tiny pair of socks by its side. Her vision and clarity snap back into focus. No, I can't let you do this, Oscar. I can't and I won't. She sees a look of concern flash across Oscar's face. Constance, this man is ruining my... our life. But Constance has no intention of backing down. Oscar, I can ignore the rumours. I, I can ignore the looks. I can even ignore the gossipers in my own godforsaken circle. But don't ask this of me. She feels tears well in her eyes. I won't put myself or my family through this. It will be cruel, Oscar. How will I live with this hanging over my head? I won't do it. She looks directly at him. You have to find another way. She stands, walks silently to the door, then turns. I love you, Oscar, but you must promise me that you will drop this at once. She walks down the stairs, out of the front door and into the crisp afternoon air. She won't let Oscar, or anyone, ruin her family. Later that day, Kettner's restaurant, Soho, London. Oscar races along Dean Street and into Kettner's. He's meeting Bosie for lunch, and for once, he isn't looking forward to it. When he told Bosie his plans to prosecute, Bosie had been ecstatic. But now Oscar needs to tell him he's changed his mind. At the door, the maitre d' greets Oscar with a look of concern on his face. Monsieur, I'm afraid Lord Queensbury has threatened the restaurant staff. Would you and Lord Alfred mind dining in one of our private back rooms? Wild bristles at the mention of Queensbury. The insolence of the man. He's about to protest, then checks himself. At least in private, Bosie can't make a scene. At the table, Wilde orders a bottle of champagne. He hopes it will soften the blow when he breaks the news to Bosie. A few moments later, Bosie charges into the room. He looks ravishing in a pale blue suit and silk yellow tie. Is this our private war room? Oscar stands as Bosie hugs him. He feels Bosie's light touch on his cheek. I've missed you, Oscar. Then Bosie sits, grabbing one of the champagne flutes and raising it in a toast. So finally, locking up the monster. Oscar hesitates, then looks Bosie in the eye. I've decided to not prosecute your father. To not locking up the monster. <laughs> Can you imagine that being disappointing from your lover? You're not going to prosecute my dad? What kind of man are you? <laughs> Oscar expects him to explode, so is unnerved when Bosie eyes him suspiciously instead. Who have you been talking to? Oscar hesitates. I promised Constance that... Bosie spits his reply. Constance? What about me? Do you know what my father has done to me? What he calls me? With shaking hands, Bosie pulls a crumpled letter from the inside of his jacket and starts reading. You miserable, misguided, insignificant, ridiculous, wretched creature. I will knock the conceit and shit out of you. Bosie pauses, looking at Oscar. My father will never stop, Oscar. He wants to destroy me. We can simply deny that side of our relationship. There's no evidence we've done anything more than had dinner together. He has no chance of winning. He's misstepped. 
This is our opportunity. Our one opportunity. Oscar thinks about the attacks on the theatre, the constant threats. Queensbury at his home. He can't imagine ever living in peace whilst this man is out there. Perhaps Bosie is right. Oscar feels Bosie's hand under the table. I want him in the dock, Oscar. We can make him look a fool. Everyone already thinks he's a pompous, blithering idiot. I want him put in a lunatic asylum. By the time dinner is finished, Oscar is convinced. The courts are the only viable option. He'll just have to make Constance understand. An hour later, Oscar and Bosey are sitting at his lawyers. I believe a prosecution would succeed. Oscar's chest lightens. He looks at Bosey, smiles. Provided, and I stress this, provided that there is no truth whatsoever in the accusations. Oscar shifts in his seat, pauses, then hears Bosey's voice from beside him. Absolutely not. All damn lies. And Mr. Wilde? Oscar feels Bosey's eyes fixed on him. No truth. No truth in the accusation whatsoever. Ah, the Bahamas. What if you could hang out with celebrities, live in a penthouse above the crystal clear ocean with all your best friends, and have it be 100% paid for? FTX founder Sam Bankman Freed made that dream a reality, but U.S. prosecutors say he was hiding a dark secret. Barely 30, the young crypto billionaire became a powerful financial figure. But in just one month, his exchange would collapse, and SBF would find himself in handcuffs. It's one of the most dramatic falls from grace and represents one of the most spectacular failures of corporate control in American history. Hear exclusive tape of Sam and his former girlfriend and business partner, Caroline Ellison, who later admitted something had gone very wrong inside their operation. From Bloomberg and Wondery comes Spellcaster, a new six-part docuseries about the meteoric rise and fall of FTX and its founder, Sam bankman Free. Follow Spellcaster wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to episodes ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Second of March, 1895, Carter's Hotel, London. Queensbury is running a shaving blade across his cheek when he hears a knock at his hotel door. Two uniformed police officers stand before him. Lord Queensbury, I have a warrant for your arrest. A Mr. Oscar Wilde has. Queensbury raises his hand and notes the surprised look on the officers' faces as he declares, I am delighted to have succeeded in bringing matters to a head. He calmly finishes dressing before being escorted from the hotel to Vine Street Police Station, where he's formally charged with criminal libel. Most people who were escorted to a police station and charged with any offence would be panicking. But it's such a product of his background and environment that actually he's totally calm in this situation. And also, this is his strategy. This is what he's planned for. This is step one on his road to bringing down Oscar Wilde. So, so far, so great. The following morning, he sits opposite Edward Carson. Queensbury intends to instruct him as his defence attorney. So he's horrified to hear, Lord Queensbury, I'm afraid it will be exceedingly difficult to prove Mr Wilde's sodomitic character, as you say, through his published writings alone. I would suggest the best course of action is to plead guilty. Put an end to these charges and... But Queensbury interrupts in disbelief. The whole town is reeking of this grotesque scandal. If I were to shoot this hideous monster in the street, I should be perfectly justified. He sees Carson shift in his seat, decides to temper his language. This man has almost ruined my son. It is the most awful trouble that could come upon a father. Wicked. Carson leans forward. Lord Queensbury, I'm no fan of Oscar Wilde, but even if we were to proceed... The case is simply too weak. Queensbury listens as Carson tells him his defence can't rest on rumour and hearsay, nor Wilde's literary works alone. 
he must prove that Wilde is a sodomite and that this is in the public interest. Queensbury nods furiously. I'll get evidence. Bosie can't be the only young man this invert has corrupted. Queensbury storms back to his hotel, determined. He's underestimated the strength of the case against him, but he has Wilde in his sights. He needs to find the evidence fast, and he thinks he knows just the man to call. 25th of March, Café Royal, London. Oscar leans his head back, lets out a hearty laugh. His publisher, Frank Harris, and George Bernard Shaw sit opposite him. His friendship circle is insane. It's like a who's who of Victorian showbiz. It's hard to think of it now, but he had a level of fame and notoriety as a literary person that hadn't really happened before. Every night out he has is like that Ellen DeGeneres selfie she took at the Golden <laughs> Globes. It feels good to be surrounded by friends. Since instructing his lawyer, Oscar has felt uneasy. Although much of the press has been sympathetic, the level of interest has caught him off guard. So today, he's here to ask Frank for his public support. Frank, dear, I need you to help me convince the illiterates that Dorian Gray is a work of genius. Oscar looks at him now, expectantly. Instead, he sees him catch George's eye. Oscar hates having to ask his friends for help. He takes a piece of lemon and squeezes it into a spritzer. Hopes it will settle his stomach. Oscar, I will do everything in my power. But I have to say, I'm worried. George immediately steps in. Oscar, this must stop. Why get involved? Let Queensbury and Bosey pursue this feud amongst themselves. Oscar feels himself withdraw. He can't handle this right now. Then he sits up alert. There's a kerfuffle at the entrance. Is it Queensbury? Frank and George turn to follow his gaze. Instead, he watches Bosey saunter over. Oscar's heartbeat lowers. He's become a nervous wreck. What have I missed, gentlemen? Before Oscar can reply, Frank cuts in. Bosey, we're just telling Oscar that he must stop this libel nonsense. Bosey casts a look of defiance at the two men sitting opposite. You can't possibly understand what Oscar and I have endured these last few months. My father is a monster. He must be stopped. Don't be such cowards. I won't hear any more about it. Oscar watches as Bosey ignores Frank and George's gaping expressions, instead pulling up a seat and beckoning to the waiter to bring some champagne. George tries changing tack. Bosey, I couldn't agree more. He must be stopped, just not through the courts. There's a very real chance that your father will be seen as a man trying to protect his son. Protect me? I don't like what you imply. Oh, don't be a fool. You can't honestly tell me there's no truth to the accusations. Juries are fickle. If one starts to doubt... Bosie bangs his fists on the table. You cannot honestly tell me that Oscar and his family should accept the stain that currently hangs over all of them. Oscar bristles at the mention of Constance, his children. He's never felt more conflicted. Bosey, it won't be your father on trial. It'll be Oscar. It's utter madness. I urge you, both of you, go to Paris. If the libel fails, Oscar risks being prosecuted, risks jail. Oscar feels his stomach turn. Perhaps he should go to Paris, go for spring. He loves the city, but Bosey interjects. You call yourself a man of principle? You disgust me, both of you. I won't end up like my brother. Oscar watches as Bosey slams his chair back, then storms out of the cafe. Oscar hears himself apologise, but all he can focus on is the pounding in his ears. He's never felt more confused, more torn. Then a thought strikes him. There is one person he can talk to, one person he trusts, and right now, he's never been more in need of their guidance. 28th of March, 1895, St James's Theatre, London. Private investigator John Littlechild fidgets awkwardly in his frock coat. He's trying to blend in backstage at St James's. A few weeks ago, he was approached by Lord Queensbury to find evidence on Oscar Wilde. 
It's now only a few days until the start of the trial, and he's still empty-handed. He's hoping that his latest tip-off, a man named Alfred Taylor, will be the lead he so desperately needs. He hadn't planned to be chasing reprobates at this stage in his life, after a long career on the force. But he needs the money. He also knows blackmail is a common racket among inverts. There isn't any honour among thieves, and there's always someone willing to talk, with a little encouragement. He just needs a piece of leverage. He lights a cigarette, is about to take a drag when he catches sight of Taylor, his arm draped around a much younger man. But Taylor quickly hails a horse and carriage and disappears down the street. Little child panics, he can't lose him. He spots a carriage across the road, jumps in and tells the driver to follow. He catches his breath as they speed past the palace and into Westminster. 15 minutes later, little child is back on his feet. Sticking to the shadows, he weaves his way amongst the empty streets. He sees Taylor and the boy slip into a flat next to an empty baker's shop. To his surprise, the two men reappear a few moments later. Little child steps back into a doorway. He wonders whether to follow. Decides instead to check out the flat. Inside, he lights a candle. In the dim light, the flat is eerie. Hundreds of fans line the walls. The window shutters are covered with two layers of thick curtains. An odd smell hangs in the air. Women's dresses strewn everywhere. At first, he's reluctant to touch anything. He feels a revulsion, hesitates. Then forces himself to start rifling through the cupboards. He hears footsteps outside. He holds his breath, ready to run. But they continue onwards. As the hour crawls on, he becomes frustrated, kicks out at a hat box lying near the dresses. The lid flies off and papers fill the air. He bends down. Letters. Little child grabs one, tries to read it in the candlelight. Dearest of all boys, I must see you soon. You are the divine thing I want, the thing of grace and beauty. But I don't know how to do it. Shall I come to Salisbury? He glances down at the letter's signatory, your own Oscar. I mean, this is there in black and white now. He's been writing these letters to God knows who else as well, and unwittingly, all this time, been incriminating himself. It feels like a long time ago that he was so cautious about being seen with people in public. He hears a key in the door. Little child stuffs as many letters as he can into his pockets, dashes to the back door, slips out and allows himself a moment to catch his breath. It could be the leverage Queensbury needs. All he has to do now is track down the boy and make him testify. 2nd of April, 1895, St James's Theatre. Flanked by Constance and Bosie, Oscar smiles weakly at an effusive fan. It's the night before the trial and he's determined to make a public show of defiance. But he's restless, and right now, his thoughts are fixed on only one person. He needs to make his excuses, leave. He makes a show of thanking his actors and production staff. He tries to brush aside his theatre manager's warning that Queensbury has hired private detectives and that he thinks one of them has been poking around backstage. Oscar can't deal with it right now. He kisses Constance goodbye and sneaks out the stage door. 20 minutes later, Oscar is edging along London Bridge. He slows as he nears a set of steps leading down to the water's edge. He listens to the lapping water, fixes his eyes on a small boat. He watches it disappear into the darkness. Oh no, tell me he's not going to do a John Darwin. <laughs> in a matter of hours, it will be in the open ocean, just a few hours from France. Time to make a decision. He turns, retreats from the steps hurries instead into the back alleys of Borough. Oscar ducks into a small side door, descends into the street's underbelly, knocks and waits. As the door swings open, he's hit with a heady smell of lavender, chamomile and patchouli. He hurries down a narrow candlelit passage to the main parlour, where he takes in the scene before him. An elderly woman sits at a small round table, 
It's covered in blood-red velvet. Her face is partially obscured by a hood, her gnarled hands covered in rings. His nerves return as he steps forward and takes a seat. Oscar is here to have his palm read. He will let this fortune teller decide whether he should stay and fight or run. Sleepless nights have taken their toll. He needs some clarity. He needs to believe his decision. All that he's putting on the line is part of a larger plan. I don't think this is a good person to go to for advice. Why not? Well, <laughs> I don't want to cast aspersions. Do not ostracise all of our palm reader listeners. It's just mad. <laughs> okay, this do. One's so, <laughs> this one's so clever would put his such a big decision literally in the hands <laughs> of someone who's making it up. With a modern lens, it screams desperation, doesn't it? But actually, at the time, this was considered a science. Oscar takes a deep breath. Will I succeed in this trial? I must know if I will succeed. He can hear the desperation in his voice. She takes his hand, cups it in her own. He watches, transfixed, as she traces her finger along the creases. Her movements cast shadows across his palm. She lingers on an intersection, mutters to herself. You have three aligned stars. Then she traces the curve of his thumb. Oscar looks at her expectantly, but she avoids his gaze. Oscar feels a surge of panic. I see. I see a very brilliant life for you. Oscar's hand trembles. His body starts to vibrate. Then I see a wall. Beyond the wall, I see nothing. But in this trial, you will triumph. And that's coming from a woman that he paid. <laughs> to be honest, we can't have it both ways, can we? We want more women in STEM. And here she is. <laughs> Oscar feels his heart explode. His shoulders relax. He feels exhausted and exhilarated at the same time. He should never have doubted Bosey. Never doubted his own convictions. Tomorrow, he will refute Queensbury's accusation. He will silence him. Rid London of this vile man, once and for all. Third of April, 1895, the Old Bailey, London. Edward Carson enters the court, taking in the sea of hungry reporters. He's never seen such interest in a case. The entire nation is gripped. He glances at Wilde. He looks relaxed in a black jacket fastened with a diamond and sapphire pin. This is like the Gwyneth Paltrow courtroom fashion show of its day. Carson studied with Wilde at Trinity. He's always thought him a charlatan. Today, he intends to expose him for the fraud he knows him to be. He has no intention of letting Wilde's renown and wit dazzle the court. The court quietens. He feels the familiar burst of adrenaline. This is the reason he loves what he does. Performance time. He rises, first looks at the jury, then at Wilde. In your introduction to Dorian Gray, you state, there is no such thing as a moral or an immoral book. Books are well written or badly written. That expresses your view? My view on art, yes. Then a well-written book putting forward perverted moral views may be a good book. I don't know what you mean by perverted. Well, I would suggest Dorian Gray is open to the interpretation of being such a novel. That could only be the case to incalculably stupid brutes and illiterates. A ripple of laughter cuts through the courtroom. It was not the intended effect, but Carson refuses to be ruffled. Do you mean to say that Dorian Gray describes the natural feeling of one man towards another? I think it's perfectly natural for any artist to admire and love a young man. And have you ever adored a young man madly? I've never given adoration to anybody except myself. The courtroom erupts. 
he's smashing it. Carson feels his usual steely disposition give way to frustration. Wilde is treating the courtroom like one of his theatres, and the court is lapping it up. Carson tries again, reading one of Wilde's letters to Bosey. Is this an ordinary letter? Certainly not. It's a beautiful letter. <laughs> with each and every attempt, Carson is met with uproarious laughter. I imagine how frustrating it is to be going up against the greatest wit of all time. And just thinking of being opposite one of the greatest wits of all time, I mean, how do you find it? <laughs> As lunch draws near, Carson cusses to himself. Queensbury looks like he's about to implode. Carson looks at Wilde now, who smirks. Wilde has made him look like a bloody fool. Carson collects himself. It will be a different story this afternoon. He's sure of that. By day's end, he will have wiped that smug grin from his adversary's face. Later that day, the Old Bailey, London. Oscar waves to the young men packed into the gallery. He hadn't expected the morning session to go quite so well. He smiles. Carson must have hated it. He settles himself into the witness box for the afternoon session, allows himself a moment to imagine his victorious dinner with Bosie. So he's caught off guard by Carson's opening question. How long have you known Alfred Wood? Oscar is momentarily stunned. Wood is a former lover of his. How does Carson know about him? I, uh, I met Wood at the Café Royal. Uh, he was a friend of Bosie's. Oscar glances at Bosie, who also looks confused. I understand that you gave Wood a sum of money. Oscar can't understand how Carson obtained such information. He determines to keep his answers short, clipped. Two pounds. Bosie asked me to be kind to him. Carson lets this answer hang in the air, then fixes him with a stare. I suggest you had immoral relations with him, and then gave him money. Wilde stammers, feeling panic bubble in his stomach. Ah, uh, per perfectly untrue. But before Oscar can collect himself, Carson has moved on. Were you staying at the Albemarle Hotel on the 26th of February, 1892? Ah. Uh, Perhaps I would need to check. I mean, at the very least, just do like a standard Oscar Wilde. No, the hotel stayed with me. <laughs> That's basically how it works, isn't it? That's such a good sort of AI version. <laughs> Chat GPT does Oscar Wilde. Did you become intimate with a young lad named Alphonse Conway at Worthing? No one of any worth would do anything intimate in Worthing. <laughs> You're really good at this. Oscar looks to his lawyer, but is forced to reply. Yes. Oscar can't understand it. He has names, dates, locations. Oscar realises in horror that Carson must have spoken to Wood or one of his other lovers. He feels sick. Oscar has to try and regain control. He has to do something. He sold newspapers at the kiosk on the pier. Well, that's the first I've heard of his connection with literature. Here we go. He's back in the game. Oscar hopes it will elicit a laugh, but this time the room is silent. Carson fires back. And did you ever open his trousers? Put your hand upon his person? Oscar spits back his reply. No. Oscar is forced to watch in consternation as Carson pulls out various gifts he had given to this boy. A silver-mounted, crook-handled grapevine stick, a photo of himself with a personalised inscription. Oscar feels a light sweat form on his neck. He tells himself it's still insinuation. He must hold firm. What was there in common between this young man and yourself? In fact, all of these young men... I delight in the company of people much younger than myself. I recognise no social distinctions at all of any kind. And to me, youth, the mere fact of youth, 
is so wonderful that I would sooner talk to a young man for half an hour than be, well, cross-examined in court. He feels discombobulated. Carson again changes track. He's relentless, meticulous. Again and again, Oscar listens and denies accusations. Do you know Walter Granger? Yes. Have you ever kissed him? No, never in my life. He was a peculiarly plain boy. He was what? Oscar immediately realises his blunder. I said I thought him, unfortunately... Uh, his appearance was so very, unfortunately, uh, very ugly. I mean, I pitied him for it. Very ugly? Yes. So the reason you never kissed him was that he was too ugly. Wilde struggles to find his footing. He hears his voice come out as a desperate whine. You sting me, sir. Insult me. And try to unnerve me in every way. At times, one says things flippantly when one should speak more seriously. I admit it. I cannot help it. This is what you're doing to me. The court falls silent as Carson calls an end to his cross-examination. Oscar feels as though he's in free fall, as if a chasm has opened at his feet. He's walked into a trap. And all he can do is move forward and desperately hope that Queensbury hasn't the witnesses to back up his claims. Because if he does, he knows he faces complete social ruin. The following morning, the Old Bailey, London. Oscar is back in the dock. He's exhausted. He's barely slept. Today he's been prepped by his lawyer. And he's trying to take comfort that Carson is unlikely to have witnesses. As a civil case, he can't offer immunity. Anyone that does come forward risks being prosecuted. It's a small comfort. He thinks of Constance, his children. He wonders what will remain of his life when he leaves court. Oscar tries to clear his head as Carson opens his latest line of attack. Tell me about Alfred Taylor. Taylor's name fills him with dread, but he must pull himself together. I've known Taylor since the early part of 1892. And you used to go to tea parties at his flat? Yes. Did his room strike you as being peculiar? Oscar can't help himself. No, except that he displayed more taste than usual. His quip is greeted by silence in the courtroom. Did you ever see Taylor in a lady's dress? Oscar knows that whatever he says, these details will be splashed across the evening papers. Carson is determined to humiliate him and anyone who's chosen to live as he has done. No, he's a man of great taste and intelligence, and I know he was brought up at a good English school. He watches Carson take a step toward him. Did you know that Taylor was being watched by the police? That he's been arrested? And that he was notorious for introducing young men to older men? No, I never heard that. Oscar feels himself wince. Carson steps forward again. Did you know that when he was arrested, he was found to be with men in women's clothing? Oscar stutters. N no. Carson spins around, addressing the room to strike one last devastating blow. I will tomorrow bring before you young men, one after another, who have been in the hands of Mr. Wilde. They will all tell you their unhappy tales. Carson looks at Oscar with revulsion. The names will include Alfred Wood, Alfred Taylor. But Oscar can't hear Carson anymore. His ears roar with his heartbeat. As Oscar is escorted from the court, he hears his lawyer in his ear. Oscar, there's a real risk that if the case continues with the evidence that Carson has, it could lead to your arrest in court. I've already heard Queensbury push for a policeman to request a warrant for your arrest. Oscar holds up his hand, silences him. Oscar knows he must withdraw the libel case knows he's now the defendant, not the prosecutor. Knows that he's always been the one on trial, 
not Queensbury. He's never felt so vulnerable. He knows he needs to fight back, but he has no idea if he'll succeed. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. This is the second episode in our series, Oscar Wilde. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read The Secret Life of Oscar Wilde by Neil McKenna, Oscar Wilde by Richard Ellman, Bosey by Douglas Murray, and To the End of the World, Travels with Oscar Wilde by Rupert Everett. I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. James Magniak wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Sound design by Jay Rothman. British Scandal is produced by Samizdat Audio. Our associate producer is Francesca Gelardi Quadrio Corsio. Our producer is Millie Chu. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our executive producers are Theodora Leloudis, Stephanie Jens, and Marshall Louis for Wondering.